Hello and welcome to the new season of the Coaching Manual podcast hosted by me, Danny Mills. Today I'm joined by former US international Jermaine Jones. Jermaine made over 400 appearances as a professional in a career that spanned 18 years, playing for some of the top Bundesliga clubs, including Bayer Leverkusen and Schalke. Jermaine featured in the USA's 2014 World Cup campaign in Brazil, where they reached the round of 16. He also enjoyed a loan spell at Blackburn Rovers in the Premier League in 2010-11 under Steve Keane. Jermaine is now co-founder of Define Sports and Entertainment Group, who manage sports stars and entertainers, and is also breaking into the world of coaching himself. In this episode, we'll be talking about Jermaine's rise through the German soccer academy system and the coaches that influence his career scoring in a World Cup and the current state of soccer in the USA. So Jermaine, thanks very much for doing this. You are, I mean, this is the first podcast we've done, I suppose, remotely. You are several thousand miles away uh, across the pond. Uh, I'm here, the home of football in the UK. Um, but if you can just start by, you're the first ex-player that we've had that has not has been brought up outside the UK system, you know, outside the, the English soccer system. So what was it like for you, uh, I think, being born in, in Germany, growing up in Chicago? What was your football, soccer experience like as a young kid? Um, I, I would say it was uh, pretty, pretty good. So growing up in Germany is like kind of the same like in England. It's the number one sport. Everybody's really focused on that and concentrated. And um, so, But I think the first years I just enjoyed to play the game. I loved it. I played it on the street with my friends and, um, and uh, yeah, then... Moved to um, different cities in, in America, but most of the time stayed in Mississippi. And then uh, got back in the age of six, seven. And then my, my parents got split. And um, I stayed with my mom and, and fell completely in love in, in, in the game and, and sticked with it. And yeah, and, and, and went through all the, the, the youth academies and systems in Germany through I made it professional. And, and what, what was it like? How, how does it compare? Obviously, you know, you, you've played you know, all over Europe, um, effectively, or some big, some big countries in Europe, and you've seen an awful lot of football. Often, you know, the, the German system was always revered as, as one of the best in the world and what they've done in, in recent years. Okay, the last World Cup didn't quite work out. Yeah. What, what was the major difference, would you say, between that and, and the English system that you experienced as well? I think in, in the time where I played uh, in England in um, for Blackburn, I would say that the difference was... Um, that how you can say it's more physical so in um it's more physical the referees are not um giving you every foul like i would say it's more if the difference to germany or spain i would say it's more the german the german league is more tactical and maybe more um more running but not like real physical so you get a lot of fouls and foul uh, called the referee calls a lot of fouls and in, in england it's completely opposite it's like more physical it's more up and down and good tackles and, and all kind of stuff. But um, I think that's the difference. But I think over the years now, you can see that um, that, that the English football is in general getting better in, in that case and, and they're making steps forward. And a lot of people go on about the facilities in Germany were always second to none, even when you were coming through as, as a young child, you know, which you know is quite a long time ago now. Were the facilities still extremely good at that time and, and having an awful lot of good quality coaches coming through? Oh yeah, uh, I think there was a number one what always uh, the German uh, culture or this German soccer culture wanted. You know, they always uh, put a lot of money into the academies, in the facilities, and in, in trying to get the best coaches over to to improve themselves. And um, I think this is why you can see that the national team of Germany is um it's always one of the top three in um in in producing young good German players. And um and they come most of the time through their own academies. And um. And that shows that their focus is really on producing their own players, and um, and and then see where the where the goal goes at the end. But um, I think most of them like Leipzig, Hoffenheim, then uh, who you have else? You have Bur- uh, Borussia Dortmund, Schalke, like yeah. And then you see, then the top clubs come, Man City, Paris, and everyone, and and take them, take the players then, and and, and bring them over to England. Do you think that's still one of the biggest differences between? England and I suppose Germany especially that the German clubs although are very very good they still rely on 
producing their own talent coming through the system, whereas you've just mentioned a lot of the top English clubs now just go out and buy it ready-made because of the, the money in the Premier League. Yeah, that's that's good. That, it can be the difference, but then you see, like, um, over the years now, Bayern Munich is, I think, is one of the stable, biggest club in the world, and they don't they don't spend money if they don't have it, you know, in them. Um, a lot of other teams, they spend money and they, they relate on the owners. And um, if the owner steps away, the, 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 the clubs can be in big trouble. And um, uh, I think that's that's something where I really like on, on Germany, that they're focused on reproducing their own players and see where, the, where it goes. Of course, Bayern Munich is still one of the tops and they're going out and buying. But they buy more the players in the league. So they they're, they're see players playing good in, in Dortmund and they buy them away from Dortmund. But... Um, but like Man City, Man United, or Liverpool, I think. Don't get me wrong. That I, I like to to watch the Premier League and I like the game how it is. And um, but uh, in general, I think over the years, I think the 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 it would be a better better way definitely to to produce your own players, especially if you have them. And Germany obviously have a a very incredible success record of doing that, producing their own players, and also they they seem to have or most of the top clubs seem to have a better connection with the fans. Um, is that still down to the fact that the majority of, of German clubs, I know there's one or two exceptions now, the majority of German clubs are still owned by the fans effectively and that keeps prices down and that keeps people more interested in the game? Yeah, it's just, um, just what I said before, is like that their focus is being in the community, having the fans being there, you know, like I, I remember playing in Schalke, is like you have, sometimes you have over 300, 400, 400 people come just to, to, to watch training if some big games are against uh, uh, Dortmund or something, you know. It's like just the people that live the life and, and they put everything into the club and and, and that's it doesn't matter who is the owner or something, you know. People stick to it. And, um, and, um, but I, but I, if you see it, I, I, I lived in Manchester, so I know how the support is for Manchester United or Manchester City. It's the same, you know. People... Maybe see it a little bit different with a different outcome, but still, uh, I think at the end it's the love of the game and the people in Manchester that wear red or or blue for their life. So, so growing up as a as a, as a young child uh, playing soccer, football, you know, whichever I'm not sure what you call it now, having been in Europe and, and in the States. Uh, but obviously, were there any particular coaches that stood out for you that guided you on the path to, I suppose, you know, have, having a fantastic career? Um, of course, yeah, I had I had a couple of coaches um, who who guided my way, and um, you know I'm still in touch with them, and I'm real thankful. And um, you know sometimes it's like, especially if you're a younger player, you 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 lose track sometimes, and um, and then it's good to have coaches who trust in you and believe in you, and um, and give you still the chance to 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 come back or or still play the game. And um, and of course I have I have a couple of guys who are still in touch, and and I'm really thankful. So obviously moving on, you you got started to play professional. Uh, you moved into the professional game. Uh, Eintracht Frankfurt, uh, I think was was your first club. You were there for what nearly five years. What were those experiences like? In the first point, I think I was not really uh, realizing what what will come. I just played, and then I got the call that I would play with the professional ones. The, and um, when I played, then um, I just I just went in and enjoyed it, and um, and then it was like a a roller coaster, you know, it's like up and downs in, in, in a career, but um, yeah, it was easy. My friends came to the stadiums, my family were there, so I just uh, lived the dream of that what I wanted in them. So it, it, it was it was easy to, to, to step into it while you're a young player, you don't have that mindset that you think about everything, but um, yeah, it was it, and it was easy while I had my family around. And then what was it like to earn promotion to the Bundesliga? So you've just said you know it was your, it was your home city, your home club. Was it extra special to make that into into the the top league in Germany? Oh well, yeah, by the, the the year when I came and made it into professional, to the first team we we went down, so we we had to play second league, and then in a young age to help the the team and the club to come back in the first league um, was special. With that, especially with that, that was a, a real special game. How we finished the game and made it and up to to the first league. Was special in um in and of course what I said before growing up in in Germany growing up in Frankfurt, so a lot of guys who stand behind the goal and supporting the, the, the this club 
I knew them from from my private life. They were good friends, and um, now I I wear the jersey and have the the chance to help this club to come back up in to the first league. Was some, was a special day, definitely. I think you you missed the German final, didn't you, against Bayern Munich um, in oh five six. Yeah, which obviously must have been it's tough, you know, to miss any games, miss a big game like that. Just how yeah. good was that Bayern Munich team, you know, at the time? When you look at the players that they had, obviously Kahn, Lucio, Balak, uh, Hargreaves, Z. Roberto, was that a real special team at the time? Oh yeah, Bayern. But Bayern is always a special team. They they always knew how they can get players from from different countries. Or back in the days, they more went in the league and they got players from their own league in them. But in this time, of course, there was. It was a uh, an unbelievable. And, and how, how how do you think they've done that, Jermaine? Because the, they don't play as well as Barcelona, Real Madrid, as a lot of even half the Premier League sides now. How do they still manage to attract world class players and keep them at that football club when so many players now seem to move for money all the time? It's it's just how they represent themselves, and um, you see it. They have like the old old guys with Uli Hoeneß. With Dominic, uh, uh, now Sally Hamicic, just all all people who played for this club, and and everyone puts the club first. So it doesn't is not the money. It's like they tell you you can you can be a part of a history if everything goes good. And um and this is of course they don't get me wrong they pay you good money to to play there too. But um at the end it's it's more um what they're representing and that's and that's is the the city by like Munich in 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 Bayern is. Uh, or in Bayern Munich with the with the guys, the older guys, they stand really behind it, and, and they don't they don't care who, what name you are. So if you don't fit into this whole system, they they don't they will not get you, you know. And um and and this shows them the the quality how they did it the years. They normally I think they went out two times or three times in the like the last three years to to buy guys in and they forgot to see what's going on in the league. So Dortmund got bigger when Klopp was there, and they, and they started winning and winning championships. So, and and then after this, they they did what they did always: going to Dortmund, taking Lewandowski, going to other teams, taking Götze from Dortmund, in in hurting teams in the league just to they have to rebuild and 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 them get stronger. So that's how how they normally did it, and that that's how they they get their players, yeah, and, and they get so strong that they can compete in Champions League and everywhere. You obviously played. Did very very well uh, at Frankfurt, and that earned you a move to to Schalke. Uh, I think in two thousand and seven. And again, you played. Was was that a huge step up? You know, some of the players that you played with in that team were world class. Was it a huge step up from from some of the teammates you played with at Frankfurt? Um, yeah, it was definitely was a step up. We, this is why I wanted to go there. You were every season normally in Champions League. And um, and then the year when I came to Schalke, there was um, uh, I think Manuel Neuer came up in a year or half season before. Then Özil came up, then Rakitic came, then we had Jefferson Fafan, Huntala. Definitely, it was a it was a Rafinha. It was a good, a good team, yeah, definitely. And you played you played holding midfield, didn't you? Mostly in that team, was it was it then? Was it a, a definitive defined role? that you would just sit in front of the back four and you would play that defensive role? Was that sort of, not invented in Germany, because we had players like David Batty that had done it, um, obviously in England and players at Manchester United. But was that a definite system that they, they like to employ in Germany, that it's that sitting player to protect the back four? Um, it, it was not really, we had we had always two six, so we had two holding midfielders. And, and, and I was more the, the guy who was allowed to go box to box. And then we had another guy who was sitting more. And... Um, but yeah, you can see it like most of the time now in, in, in most clubs, there is always one guy who sits and, and holds that position and, and um, is a clean passer and um, tries to control the game from there. And that's, that's most important. Like when you see the football now, if you, you, can, if you have a good, a good guy in front of the six, you can control the whole game from that, from that position. Back in the days, it was more like the number 10. When I look back, it was more like the guy who controlled the game and you had to take him out of the game, but now is it more than the six or eight who control the game? And so, and um, yeah, they're, they're, I love this position, especially being in control of the game, so you can dictate where where everything goes. 
in in defense and offense and um yeah I'm, I I I wish I can play it still. You played with arguably who is now recognized as one of the world's greatest ever goalkeepers um in Manuel Neuer. But obviously yeah. he, he's been recognized for his ability to play outfield. Again, that didn't quite go so well in in the World Cup uh, where he's up the pitch and, and tried a little turn didn't quite come off. But he's been credited with changing the face of goalkeeping almost with you know yeah. the the sweeper keeper role. Was he doing that in the early days or is that something that he developed as as he went through his career? Um you, you know with Manuel Neuer is the difference that Manuel is a guy who really don't care what people think about him, you know? So when he came when he started playing or I, I met him in Schalke when he was young. So his his best friend is his goalkeeper coach. In um in in the goalkeeper coach was the second goalkeeper in the second team of Schalke. In um in you always saw like after trainings they were coming together, they were they were doing stuff, they were trying stuff out and in Manu was from day one, he was like he he don't care. He he went out, he tried to dribble Dribble people shoot in in tries to shoot from far for far back like when we had like small field goals and stuff, and um you you definitely can see that he had the the, the quality not just with his feet he had this quality too in, in 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 general in the goal you know but he's in Germany you say like the goalkeepers are a little bit like crazy you said that in England too goalkeepers, go, go, are, goalkeepers are all are all crazy yeah they're all nuts so he's he's definitely nuts he's definitely nuts he's just if you see him. Amazing human being, but if it goes to the game, he he don't care. He wants to win, and and I remember there was situations where he was still young, and we had a an, an older age back four, and he went nuts on them that everybody's turning around like and like my guy, you have to chill out a little bit, you know. But <laughs> but he really don't care. You, you played with another amazing player. I, I guess he was pretty good at the time uh, in even Rakitic. Obviously, he's gone mm-hmm. on to be sensational. Barcelona, Croatia, obviously almost winning the World Cup. Was he as good then and did he really stand out with special technical ability that we see now or or was he a, a slow burner and took time to come through? I think for, for Ivan, the, the, biggest, the biggest step forward was when he left and he went to Sevilla. I think that made him Completely different player, but don't get me wrong. He played already amazing when he was in Schalke, but um, then definitely he stepped it up from Sevilla and then to Barcelona. It was it was it is crazy to see. Yeah, but it's the same with with, with Özil. You know, why like in the time when they both were in Schalke, they were always fighting about the number ten and who gets the ten, who can play the ten, and and then Özil left to Werder Bremen. He 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 took off from Werder Bremen, went went to Real Madrid. And then from there, it's a uh, own story, you know. It's kind of the same with Rakitic, and um, but um, both both amazing players, yeah. What, what do you think of uh, Özil now? Because he he divides opinion in the Premier League. Undoubted mm-hmm. ability, World Cup winner. Uh, the way that he played at Real Madrid, I think more assist than, than any other player in Europe when he was there. Incredible ability, but he doesn't. He he has a almost a language. Uh, to simply a lazy looking style at times and he gets an awful lot of criticism in the Premier League for that is that unjust do you think yeah yeah no he's Özil is a number 10 100% number 10 he's lazy without the ball but amazing with the ball so that's how you get it like the 10s you have to have somebody who's making the dirty work for him maybe in England is it more a risk to have a player like this why you have a lot of guys on the on the sixth position. They're nuts in England, so they they take guys out like him. And um, but if you see, if everyone is honest, like if he if he's on his game, he he's a game changer. So in in and I always say number tens like they're kind of like divas. So you have to you have to see that um that you, that you keep him in a good mood mood and um and, and try to to help him that he's just a guy on the field and and I think if you do that. Uh, he shows you this is why he he won the World Cup and and, and he played for Real Madrid. He played for big time clubs and um, and he will continue to, to to show it with Arsenal. You're listening to the Coaching Manual podcast hosted by me, Danny Mills. You, you played in the Champions League. Uh, unfortunately, were knocked out to to Barcelona in the quarterfinals um, in, in the Camp Nou. 
I played against them several years before that when they were exceptional. But what are your memories of, of that game, playing against that incredible um, Rijkaard side? Um, I remember I played, uh, I think I played, we played with three strikers in our play. Because all I remember when I played there is not touching the ball and, and chasing around after it and, and not getting near anybody because they were just so technically <laughs> far superior to what we were. No, to, to be honest, we played, we played pretty good. And we, I think we lost 2-1 and we had him on the edge to, to win. But then... I right, mean, so I we, we, who... we were 3-0 down at half time and hadn't touched the ball. Uh, <laughs> no, no, we were... <laughs> We were good. We we were not. We we were we were fight. We say this. We we fight it a lot. The first half and then second half we were in the game and then, but yeah, you said they had so much quality that that you have to be careful with every player. So in in um they're using what they get one chance to score. So that that was our, our knockout. And and then in 2011, uh, you came to Blackburn Rovers. I think Steve mm-hmm. Keane was the manager at the time. How did that come about? The, a move to Blackburn. I don't either. I don't know. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. I was, I was, I was in a fight in Schalke, and then my agent called me like two days later, and he said, "There's a, there's a guy coming from India. He's like an owner of Chicken Wings or yeah. something. Yep. And um, he wants to change something with Blackburn, and in they, they won the, they won the championship over there and everything. And I'm like, you know what? I just want to play the next six months, and then I look what's coming next." And then that he told me like, yeah, Blackburn Rovers, let's go. And I said, okay, let's sign it. I want to play. I don't care. I just want to play. And, and then I fly to. This was the time when I went to Manchester. And then I stayed in Manchester. And I was thinking, okay, it's close to Manchester. And but then we driving out to the middle of nowhere. And I was like, okay. But um, to be honest, it was an amazing time. I really enjoyed it. And with Steve Keane, a coach. Who, who I laughed a lot, and, um, and what, what was what was Steve Kidd? Because he was a surprise appointment at Blackburn when he got the job. You know, he, he had a very very good reputation as a as a coach, but as a, a number three or four coach or mm-hmm. working with the, the younger players, he was suddenly thrown into the limelight. You know, as, as the as the number one guy. What yeah. was he like? I'm assuming he was a very very good coach. But what was he like uh, around the players? How did he deal with with some of the big names in your side? Um, he was around the, the guys. He was pretty cool. He was, he he always he knew what he wants to do. He had his plans, and um, of course you can discuss if the plans were good, the style of play and everything. But, but um, I think with the players we had and everything, the situation we got into, and um, I think he handled it pretty good. And um, personal as a man, I would say like he's an amazing human being. So, and then the situation I think when we made it against I think the Wolves the last game when we stayed in the league. With a tie get with them, and um, he he was pretty happy. But then I think the next year, then he got fired. I think there was some some stuff happened with him private, and um, in a uh, in um, yeah. And then I, I left, and uh, I don't know really what happened. But we had a good team. But I think the tough part is in England just to keep everyone on the same board. And um, yeah, that's I think that's the toughest part in England. Let's move on to sort of your international career. You played some games for the, the junior levels um, at Germany. I think you played for the under-21s uh, for, the, for the German side. But then you decided to switch allegiances and, and go and play for the US. How did that come okay. about? Um, and was it so a difficult it was, decision? Yeah, it, 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 what it was, I played, um, the, I started with the U18 and then U20. And I went to Argentina for the U20 World Cup back in the days. And after that, I came back and played a couple of, what it was, like a U21 games or something. And then I asked my agent if there's a chance to, to switch the countries and play for the United States. Well, I felt like I maybe can play already in a younger age for, for, for the first team in America. So we, we reached out and we tried. And then we got a signal back that it's not possible why we played already for the U20 World Cup. And there's a rule that you cannot play anymore. So I said, OK. So my focus started being completely on Germany. And um, so then I made it in with, with, with Jürgen Klinsmann for the first team and, and was more in the ranking. But then 2006, I broke my shin. So that, that, that whole picture at World Cup was done. And then 2008, I focused on going to the Europe. And, and I felt like with Yogi Löw, I, I had a good uh, preseason before the, in everything. But he decided to take Tim Borowski, who was another player who played in better Bremen in that time. 
So I, I went out and then before Asia, the Asian trip, um, me and him, we talked and I told him, I said, my agent called me and he said that they changed the rule 2010 and it's maybe a chance to switch the countries in if he, if he's okay with it or he thinks like I have to stay. And, and he said, no, I, I think you have to, you have the chance to come play here. But of course it's tough. We have good players, but you guys have to battle for the position. And, um, and I said, okay, I want to see what the, the national team coach of America says. And so I had a meeting with Bob Bradley while he was over in Germany to see his son. So we sit down, we went out for dinner, we talked and, and after we talked, I said to him like, look, I have loved for both countries in, in, um, but, um, if I have the chance and you tell me that I can play, I want to come and represent the country. So, and, um, he said, look, if, if you want to play for us, we would appreciate that and we would take you with open arms. So I said, if a coach tells you that, it's an easy way. So I went and, uh, and from there, yeah, yeah, history. Do you think Bob Bradley's style of coaching was more suited to international management? Because obviously he came to English Premier League and it really just didn't work. You know, he, he failed in a, in a big, big way when he came into the England. Yeah, no, I... You know, it's English soccer and English players, or in general, they're all different. They have a different lifestyle and different mental, like seeing the game and everything. You know, it's it is not easy. I'll be honest. Like I, when I played in Blackburn, there were situations where I was thinking too. I was like shaking my head and say, "There will, there's no chance that will happen in Germany. No chance if this player will do this." And um, but in England, it's different. So in in, in, in many ways. And, um, and I think Bob, when he came over to, to England, he was not ready maybe for, for, for all that. And um, it's still different if you coach in Norway or Sweden or you coach for, uh, for the American national team where maybe the pressure is not that on like it is in Germany or in England. Obviously, you played in the World Cup. Is, is that the pinnacle of your career? Are they some of the best moments? I mean, for me, obviously, playing in the World Cup, it's, it's what every boy dreams of doing um, that's interested in football yeah no there was missing 2006 missing don't go in 2008 to the Euro Cup I I knew 2014 um, I was in Besiktas Istanbul in the time played there and I said I just want to focus on this World Cup I don't want to get injured I, I, I can't miss this World Cup right that's that's my last maybe and and I want to go there that's in Brazil an amazing soccer country so I want to be in that flight when, when we go over with the national team. So then go in there, you know how it is, like all this events is the biggest party in the world and everybody's looking, millions of people. I was, I, was, I was in Brazil, don't worry. I spent six weeks in Brazil. It was absolutely incredible. Um, oh, and I, it was, and I was amazing. And I was in, partying most nights where you were probably tucked up in bed preparing. <laughs> I, I tell you, the, the, the games where we had no games, our party too. <laughs> There it is right now. We had some good parties in our hotels, but um, but it's 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 just it is it was amazing. And then having my kids over there, having my 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 family was just special. And then scoring against Portugal, you know that you will be in history of American soccer. Well, talk talk, it, talk us talk us through that goal because it was it was a little bit better than average, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, you, you you know the 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 funny part was like before the corner that. I think somebody talked, like the Marcus Bici or somebody came to me and said, if you get a good shot or you can, you can shoot, shoot, you know? And, and I see just the ball comes in, it bumps out. I think somebody flicked it out. And then I see Nani's like a little bit far away from me and I'm, and I trying to take my first step, uh, touch around him. And then I see this one guy standing in front of me and, and, and I see if I can get the ball around him just in the corner then place it in there, like the, the goalkeeper will have no chance when he sees it too late. And um, exactly that happened. And then, yeah, emotion go free, right? Well, so hopefully we'll we'll get a clip of it and we'll whack it out on our social media site so people can see how good it really was. I think you've been very, very modest about how, how good that goal really was. But what is it like to play alongside the likes of uh, Donovan and Dempsey, who I suppose were iconic not just in the states uh, but obviously had, had been successful outside of the US as well and, and were revered as great players um, in England as well I think we had like a couple good guys who have been in, in, in England Scotland around that whole area I think if you look Clint Dempsey what he did with Fulham was was just an amazing coming over there being alone and doing all this stuff 
the Tim Howard going to Manchester United. And then uh, I, I played with Claudio Reina, obviously, at Manchester City, who was obviously oh, exceptional yeah, for the U.S. But, but it's like, in general, I think it's like it's, it's so good to see kids going over, especially now the new generation. They're all going over. They're all playing in Germany or England. It's it's just so good for the for the game in general here to grow. And and I say always the main focus cannot be MLS. And there's nothing against MLS. It's just for me. It's like I say, main focus have to be national team. So if we producing and having good national team players all over the world, our soccer will grow. But at the end, it's like every kid, every fan watches the game in 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 on the TV. And this is how you you pull players or pull kids to play soccer, right? So if it's just here in the league, the league is not right now in the like Premier League or Bundesliga, so where people are really going and watching it, it's still like on the edge. It's still building and getting better. But I think our national team have to have the best players overseas somewhere, and that's that's I like it how it how it works right now. Because the USA national team has always done incredibly well for having, I suppose, a lot of players that do play in the MLS haven't had too many too many superstars, uh, but I, I think they've always punched above their weight but obviously one special player that you've got at the moment um, obviously that's coming to the Premier League next season um, is Christian Pulisic how mm-hmm. do you think he will be able to fit into the Premier League do you think he'll be a success at Chelsea yeah he, he definitely will be an success he will be super good I tell you this just what he just had to do and this is a normal crawl is like he has to get bigger from sizing but um if this is the next, uh, that would be the next step. That would be easy, I think. In England, you would grow from 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 yourself, from alone, from age wise. And but soccer wise, this kid is special, and um, you can see it just if you train with him and play with him. He enjoys just the moment playing with the ball, and and this is like what makes him so dangerous. He don't care who's watching. He don't care who's there. He's just out there, and, and he wants to play with the ball. He's like, if you see him, he's like he's 15 or. 14 years old, like you throw him a ball everywhere he sees a ball, he's going and doing stuff in. It's 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 incredible. How big a blow was it last year for the USA not to qualify for the World Cup? Because I think they they were missed. Um, mm-hmm. and, you know, whatever you think, you know, people don't. I think outside America don't associate uh, the USA as, as a great football nation, but they've always had good teams they've always done better than people had thought what is a huge blow to US soccer uh, and sort of to the inspiration of those young kids missing out on the World Cup it was a big blow a real real big blow and well I, I saw it coming so in January camp uh, before the World Cup when Bruce Arena took over I'd had a conversation with people and I told them already I said from that what I see right now in the January camp I can tell you guys that we don't go into the World Cup. And this is nothing personal. Like It's just seen the, the outcome of the change from Jurgen Klinsmann going back to Bruce Arena. I knew that this is not a good, not a good switch. And um, at the end, I think if you saw the games, um, then especially against um, Trinidad, it, it showed just that, that, that we don't deserve it to go. And um, we don't play the game what we can play. And we were just too focused on on individual players try to to push them forward in and, and that that was not the country how we always uh produced our games and how we played in them um, and this is um i think was the outcome then and of course it hurt it hurt the whole country right what i said before if you go into a world cup in america when i think in brazil we had num- uh, uh, i don't want to be completely wrong I, I think i heard that america was the number one country with support in in brazil in in worldwide, if you go with the TVs and all the stuff, and um, that shows that the people are really interested. And um, but um, that's America too. That we we need this. We need the big stage. This is why we have the playoffs in every game or in every sport here. That you have a big events and and World Cup is the biggest. So everyone wants to be on that. And, and now you're missing it. A lot of people go on, on vacation, you know, and don't care about the the whole uh, whole World Cup. And that hurts the the country. So how do you think um, Greg Berhalter is going to do um, as national team manager? Is, do you think, you know, is success more more likely uh, for, for 2022 in, in Qatar? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I was the whole time, bef- I said that I hope that they get a coach who's um, not an American coach, but seeing him then coming by Greg, I think me and Greg uh, have a good relationship and 
I think he's the best American coach we can get. So he showed it with Columbus that he, he has always the plan. And with Columbus, he don't have the best players, but he always made it possible to come play playoffs and uh, came far most of the time. So and, um, it shows that he, he knows what he's doing. And now he has a better squad with the national team. He can he got a bigger pool where he can pull players in him. So I think he 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 will he will have a good success. Like he's definitely the best American coach you can get. Now that you're moving into coaching, what's that transition like? Has it been easy? Has it been difficult? And and what have been the challenges for you? Uh, moving into coaching, what was the challenges? I think I think the the, the biggest part was in the beginning, just to. To set up the sessions and, and then being in being in front of guys and always talking, you know, where you, you 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 most of the times like for 18 years playing, you you know the sessions, you can run everything through, but just to set it up in the right way that you don't have to stand around, that you can move straight to the next session and, and go. That's all stuff like a learning process. And um, and and that I would say like the first couple of weeks were like kind of where I needed help, but but now it's it's just like experience wise, you know, taking that what I know from the game. What I did day in, day out, every day, take it in and, and just prepare yourself in the best way to set it up. And are there any particular managers, coaches that you still sort of, before you set up a session, you think back and think, oh, he did a great session, I'll, I'll use that one. Is there one manager or coach that you sort of particularly particularly rely on for certain sessions? Um, there's there's a couple of guys where, where I look at, Kind of styles what they did. I like Ralph Rangnick, who's coach now of Red Bulls uh, Leipzig. Um, then I like Jurgen Klopp. I'm, I had a, I have a good relationship with Jurgen. Jurgen Klinsmann. There's a lot of stuff where you can really look in. You know, from every coach I had, I try to take pieces out when I sit down and and I make a, a plan for the next day what's what's coming and what we want to do. So the same like with speeches and stuff like that. I think every coach you had in 18 years. You can you can take pieces out and, 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 and use them for your own career as a coach. What's been the how I put this? What's been the one best piece of advice that you've received from one of those great managers that is like you is your go to reminder of, of what it's all about? Um, is there one piece of advice or one message? That he's sort of constantly thinking, right? I I have to deliver this to the players that I'm coaching. I think it's like I had one coach. Like his name is Stu, uh, Hoop Stevens. He's a Dutch coach, and um, when I came back from Blackburn Rovers, he was new to coach, and and he 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 called me in his office, and he said to me, "Look, I know a lot of people are talking about you here, but um, I don't care. Just go out, show me what you have, and um, and um, I know there's there's maybe players with more talent." But I know you have heart, so show me everything, give everything. If you if you're the hard worker for this team, you can be the engine. Let the other people be the let them shine. But every team needs an engine, you know. So in the moment that he told me that, I knew. Okay, I went out and I played with amazing players. But I knew I'm just the engine, and the other guys get the spotlights. But um, but it's that that was my role. And this is sometimes I tell my kids, I say, look, you don't have to be the best player always on the team. But it doesn't mean that the best player can always win the game alone. So if you if you just a guy in the back and you have to defend, that's your part. Do the best the best thing you can do for to finish your part and then let them do their thing and at the end you will win games. You know, that's how easy it is. I think that's come across from most of the people that we've had on the podcast and we've spoken to. They've all gone on about standards, discipline, hard work. Uh, you know, they're probably the most important things for for players. But are there any pieces of advice you can offer to young coaches that are maybe just starting out in the game? You said that you struggled a little bit how to set up sessions and do that sort of thing. Is there any particular advice you can offer to young coaches to help them out? I think in a, in a, as a as a young coach, if you start, I think it's the it's keep it easy. And most of the time, then what age you train is, I think if if they're younger, then just just try to keep the game. Uh, in, in, in quick in quick games that they can play more and, and not standing around so much. So I think that's that's the that's the easiest one like what you can give like young coaches. Don't go in and in and, and, and try to set up everything what you're reading. Why right? every coach who starts, I think you start reading a lot of coaching books and in Mourinho books and Pep Guardiola. And then if you start and you have an 
U12, I don't think it, you can make a session from Pep Guardiola, you know. So you just have to see the real and realize the, the truth. And in, in, in there's sometimes like just put two goals and, and let them play and then correct them in situations. But um, then from age to age higher, you can you can start thinking more into tactical sessions and, and crosses and passing and all kind of stuff. So you, you've had a fantastic career. You've done a little bit of coaching. You also now got a role at um, Divine Sports and, and Entertainment Group. Mm-hmm. Where are you going to go from here? Is it going to be national manager of the USA, or is it going to be a, a role alongside or, or outside of football? You know, I, I had always this big dream to to open this agency, and it was already when I played. But um, I always wanted to see, find the right fits, and, and and build something, build something good around me. Then, especially living here now in LA, where you have a, 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 a big reach of entertainment. You have a big reach of sport in general. So um, it, it's, it, it made just click when I, when I stopped playing. So, in, um, so then I started this. That's something what I have. I built this up with my, with my business partner, Troy, his name. So we built it up. And, and now we're working on that all. But at the end, at the end it's my, my end goal is staying in the game. It doesn't matter what it is. I still make my UEFA license, A license. So... If if there's an opportunity to to coach, I definitely think to I will go coaching. But I still want to be out there every day on the field, not anymore on the field like to play, but just being around coaching, have a different different outcome on the game, and and, and that's my goal. And and then Troy and my 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 older son will slide in for me when he starts. He's 17. When he starts 18, 19, he's already in the business too. He looks a little bit behind the scenes. So that he can take over and he he will do then the runs and the stuff with the agency with Troy and I can concentrate on coaching. Fabulous. Well, thanks very much, Jermaine. Hope it goes very, very well. Uh, and hopefully when you're a USA national manager, your agency's running the world, uh, you'll come back on the podcast. Yeah, I will be there. Just let me know. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much to Jermaine for joining us in the latest episode in Season 2 of the Coach Manual podcast. Thanks everyone for listening. You can keep up to date with the Coach Manual on social media. Follow us on Twitter at Coach Manual or on Instagram and Facebook at The Coach Manual. Register for an account now for session planning tools, high quality coaching content and more essential resources for football coaches at thecoachemanual.com. See you next time.